Okay, in this session we are going to look at the most important document in the universe, the periodic table. So the periodic table is a list of all of the elements we know about arranged by atomic number. But there is also an amazing amount of more information that we can gather from looking at the periodic table and looking at the way it's structured and the atoms are structured in that. If you're not familiar with the work of Mendeleev, who was the person who developed the modern periodic table, go by, research that absolutely amazing story. He was actually able to identify elements that hadn't been discovered yet by putting them together in a periodic table and realising there were holes of where there should have been an element and then people subsequently went and discovered those elements. What do we need to know about in terms of the periodic table? We need to know about period, which is the rows of the periodic table, and that indicates the number of shells of electrons. We need to understand the group, which is the column, which is an indication of the number of electrons in the outer, or sometimes we call the valence shell. We need to understand atomic radius, which is an indication of the size of an atom. We need to understand valency or charge, the atom. So what charges is that atom likely to have when it gains or loses electrons? We need to understand electronegativity, which is the tendency of an atom to attract electrons from other atoms to it. So it's really a, a measure of how much it wants to gain or lose electrons when it forms chemical bonds. This is becoming a really important characteristic as we go forward. We need to understand about whether elements are metals or non-metals. So metals are those shiny grey things, conduct electricity, usually a solid, except for mercury, at room temperature. Non-metals tend to be not conduct electricity, more likely to be gases or liquids at room temperature. We also need to understand about the S, P, D and F block, and that just relates to those outermost subshells, the S subshell, the P subshell, the D subshell and the F subshell. I'm not going to write anything in this space down here, but I've left that there so you can make some notes as I go through the next slide. Okay, so I've gone into P table and I'm going to give this a go. I'm not exactly sure this is going to work or not, but let's see. Um, so firstly we have our period. And as I said, the period is the row or the number of shells. And in the first period... I don't think I need to go there, hang on a sec. We have hydrogen, helium with only their one shell of electrons. And then we get lithium, we've got two ones, here we've got the electron configuration here, two, two. So we've always got two shells of electrons in the second period, down to sodium, two, eight, ones, and then we've got three shells across here. Then when we get to potassium, we have four shells all the way across this fourth period. And that pattern obviously continues. We have our groups, which are our columns. So group one, group two, we generally just refer to these as the transition metals. We don't go into specific group numbers. And then we come across here. Sometimes we call this group three, four, five, six, seven, eight, when we're just really talking about the first 20 elements. But we've got 10 transition metals. So in effect, we need to add 10, so that's group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. And that's really telling us, particularly with group 1, one electron in the outer shell, one electron in the outer shell, one electron in the outer shell, one electron in the outer shell. Group 2, they've all got two electrons in the outer shell. Group 3, all have three electrons in the outer shell, or group 13, depending on which one you want to call it. Um, I'm happy with either. Group 4 or 14 all have 4 electrons in the outer shell. 15 all have 5 and so on. So that's the trend in the periodic table in terms of um, what we see with the period, the relationship between the period and the number of shells and the group and the number of electrons in the outer shell. So nextly, let's have a look at atomic radius. And if you look up here, I can select I can select lots of properties here, but I'm going to start off with a calculated radius or atomic radius. And firstly, the, the darker the shade of green, the bigger the atom. So the, the shade of color is telling us about what atom this, what the atom, um, what the size or the radius of that atom is. 
Now, as you would expect, as we come down a group, so as we come down the periodic table, it doesn't matter where we go, just bring my cursor across, down, down, the atoms get bigger. So as we get more and more shells, the atoms get bigger. So if you want to just see that radius, there's hydrogen, lithium is 167, sodium is 190, potassium is 243, that's highlighted in yellow, rubidium 265. So we get that trend always as we go down. But what we might not predict is as we go across a period, the atoms actually get smaller. So lithium is 167, beryllium goes becomes element number four, so it's, you know more protons and electrons, but it gets smaller, 112. Come across to boron, 87, carbon, carbon 67, nitrogen 56, oxygen 48, fluorine 42, neon 38. So the atoms get smaller as we go across the period. So across gets smaller, down the group gets bigger. Uh, the next thing we can look at is the charge. I'm just looking to see if one of these... Yep, we'll go to this one here, which is orbitals, which is the electron configuration one. Um, we're going to need this again. This one here puts puts helium in group 2 rather than having it above neon. I, you know, helium sort of has two electrons in its outer shell, so that makes sense for group 2, but, but don't get worried or confused by that. Um, so everything in group 1 has one electron in its outer shell. It wants to lose that electron generally, so it forms a plus 1 charge. So these numbers at the bottom... Here are the charge that it normally forms. Everything in group 2, with the exception of helium, which has got a full outer shell and is happy, wants to lose two electrons, forms a plus 2 valency or a plus 2 charge. So charge and valency, same thing. I think I said that before. Same here with, we come across group 3. There's a couple of exceptions further down. Generally, though, form 3 plus charge ions. Now, carbon and things in group 4 or group 14, they rather than form ions as such, they tend to more share electrons, but you'll generally see here they're going to share four electrons. There's a couple of exceptions, but quite commonly they'll share four electrons because they've got four in their valence shell. We'll come across to this side now. Obviously, the inert gases, group 8 or group 18, they've got full outer shells. They don't gain or lose electrons. They're unreactive. So they don't really form ions or have charges or valencies. But in group 7 or 17, depending on what we're using, these all have 7 electrons in their outer shell. They want to get to 8 or they want to get that P shell full, which is going to have 6, plus there'd be already 2 electrons in the S shell to give that 8. And they will generally form minus one ions. They want to gain one electron. Minus one, minus one, minus one. Now there's some other valencies that they can form, but we're not going to worry too much about those. Group six, six electrons in the sh outer shell want to gain two, so they will find minus two charge. Group five, generally five electrons, they want to get to eight, so they want to gain three, so they form minus three charges or minus three valencies. The next property we want to look at is electronegativity. So I talked about electronegativity before, um, which is that, a, you know, how much an atom wants to attract electrons from another atom. So either how much it wants to gain them or lose them. And the trend here is essentially that I always remember, fluorine is the most electronegative atom. Fluorine wants electrons more than anyone else. So, as you get closer to fluorine, you get more electronegative. So, fluorine, we know it forms a minus one ion. It really wants to take those electrons. So, as we go... Sorry, just drag this. As we go across the period, electron, 
across, electronegativity always increases. And then as we go up towards fluorine, electronegativity decrease, increases, or if we go down, it decreases. So fluorine is the most electronegative. The values here, or oh, fluorine, sorry, there's fluorine 3.98, oxygen 3.44, nitrogen 3.04. Now, electronegativity is going to be really important when we come back and look at secondary bonding later on. So, um, just we will come back to that at that point and we'll look exactly at these values. But for now, we're just interested in the trends. Over on this side, these things, they don't want to gain electrons at all. They want to lose, they want to give their electrons up. You know, potassium will react violently with water because it really wants to lose that electron. It doesn't want to gain an electron at all. So, that has quite a low electronegativity. 0.82 is the exact value there, highlighted in yellow. So that's our general trend illustrated in terms of electronegativity. Finally, if we just look at the uh, metallic and non-metallic behaviour, the line for metallic and non-metallic generally goes, steps through, actually it steps through about here, somewhere where my pen is going, um, where my little cursor is going. So everything up in this top right hand corner is non-metals. And we've got this key here that sort of shows that. And then everything over this side is metallic. So if you want the trend, as we go across the period, we become more non-metallic. As we go down, we become more non-metallic. Along this border, we have what are called metalloids here in the green. They are things that can exhibit both metallic and non-metallic behaviour. Again, when we look at acids and bases and some other things, we'll explore these in more depth later. Finally, we have, and I think if I go to orbitals, yep, that's the best. We have the S, the P, the D and the F block. And once again, these are pretty self-explanatory. The S block, oops, sorry. The S block is over here. Everything in the S block has S electrons as its outer electrons. So you can see that here in this little highlighted. Whichever one I click, the ones in yellow that are highlighted are always the S electrons. The outermost electrons are the S electrons. The section in the middle here, the transition metals, they all have D electrons as their outer shells. See, whichever one I click, the highlighted electrons are always the D electrons there in the middle. Over on the right hand side here in the different green, um, we have the P block. Whenever we highlight these, you will see that it's always this P block here that's got the highlighted yellow arrow because the outer electron are in the P block. And down the bottom here, we don't do much with these, but just so you're aware, of, this is the F block. So all of these, if we click on any of these, we will see up here, we have the valence or the outermost electrons being the F block electrons. Um, so that, I think, covers all the trends in the periodic table. Um, I may not have mentioned the D block can have lots and lots of different, well, lots of valencies, lots of different charges. So we don't tend to worry too much about those. We just need to be aware that they can have different charges and there isn't necessarily a general trend in what charge the ions have in that D block. I just think I forgot to mention that earlier. I hope I didn't repeat myself. So... That is an analysis of the trends that we see in, um, in the periodic table in various properties um, that at least we are interested in chemistry in this year. Thank you.